before I want to start, I want to get an idea of who's in the room and kind of what disciplines we're all from. So I'll go, who's mechanical? Good choice. Uh, who's civil, structural, awesome, process, petroleum, oil and gas? No. All right. Uh, another question is, what is our core business? So something, I um, am a mechanical engineer. And apart from the specific kind of core pieces of business that we all do in our specific jobs, is safety something we all talk about? And I want to get a show of hands if, if in your company or in the area you work in, they say safety is our core business. A few people. Wow. This is less than I would have expected. Who, is safety not our core business? Just sussing it out. Is, um, do we feel like we're empowered usually if there's something wrong going on with safety to kind of say there's something going wrong? Is that a thing that we're taught in our companies and in the areas that we work? The power to kind of sort of step back, take five, etc. Awesome. The question then I have is the concept of diversity core business. Who thinks the concept of diversity is core business? I know if I worked, so I work as a drilling engineer in oil and gas. Um, and if I asked the drillers if diversity was core business, I'd get laughed out of the rig. They'd be like, mate, who are you? It doesn't matter what you look like or where you're from or what gender you are or all that matters is you know how to drill fast or you know how to drill correctly or you know how to drill safely. Right, but for me, what I want to talk about and for me, oh, the reason I'm showing you this is partly because I'm self-absorbed with vehicles. Um, and the reason that I get to talk to you is because um, as a mechanical engineer, I spent a bit of time in Formula SAE and all those sort of Formula student, that kind of thing. Um, and that's the team. And that's the rig I work on. But coming back to this topic about diversity, when it comes to what is core business and what diversity is and what diversity looks like, I think we have different kind of conversations. And I think, you know, being a female who's Muslim and brown and an engineer, everyone is always shocked, right? The first thing people do when I say that I'm a driller is they like double take. They're like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> wait, wait, what, what exactly do you do? Which is hilarious. Um, Partly because I guess it's about the expectations that people have of who should be in different roles, right? But we've been talking about gender and engineering for a really long time. And I don't want to kind of go over the same thing that you've heard about. Because obviously, things aren't changing. So the conversation needs to be different. So why is diversity important? We've heard about the business imperative, right? People will tell you if you have X number of women on your board, you'll increase you know, your bottom line. If you have more people of colour, you know, at your sales, you'll increase your number of sales. But what I find really interesting is the last line that I talk about. So hands up if you've heard of the Macondo incident, the BP Gulf of Mexico blowout. I'm hoping it's everyone in the room. Otherwise, where were you? <laughs> Mate. So... As a, as a driller, we look at the Macondo incident in great, great detail, right? And we're taught that there was eight specific things that happened, right? Eight events that followed each other in quick succession to lead to the uncontrolled blowout. One of the decisions, right, at one of the points, they did a test, what they called an inflow test, right, to, dis to see if the well was actually secure. Essentially, what you do is you release the pressure, and if there's an inflow, you'll see it on your test results. And it's clear, it's a very clear indication of whether or not the well is secure. They did this test on the rig, and it failed. But the way they interpreted the test was that it didn't. How did that happen? How did a group of people, right, who are all trained in this particular thing, and this particular test, and they've done this test many, many times, and it was a whole bunch of different things. You know, the fact that they were over time and over budget, they all wanted to go home. The fact that they had what they call confirmation bias. So they all believed that the well was secure, and so they interpreted what actually ended up happening is one of the senior, engineer, one of the senior rig supervisors looked at the test and said, I've seen this before, it's called the bladder effect. There is no such thing as the bladder effect. He just made it up. It's like you see a crack in a bridge, and you know, actually, that's what they call the shattering effect. No. 
<laughs> that doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> but somebody with authority in the room walked in interpreted it in a way that everybody else kind of already had in their mind agreed with, and they looked at the information to confirm their existing beliefs. And because they were all trained in a similar way, because they were all looking at the information in a similar way, they also suffered from another bias called in-group bias, where everybody thinks about things the same way, or group think, right? There is nobody who's willing to, as we say in safety culture all the time, to sort of stand up and say, hey, I think something's wrong here. And so when I talk about diversity, I don't talk about just getting more black chicks on your rig, although that would be awesome, right? Have epic dance party? I'm not sure. But <laughs> just like mix it up completely. But when, I'm talk when I talk about diversity, it is about getting different people in the room so that you can change or affect or mitigate the effect of cognitive bias. Because as the Macondo incident shows us, those kind of biases can have drastic, actual, real-time impacts on our operations. BP lost $50 billion and most of its credibility. And if maybe if they had different people in the room, it would be different. So there's another question when I talk about bias, and it's an example, and if you've already heard it, I apologize, but it's a great example of what, how bias kind of plays out in our life. So there's this story of this guy and his, like the a father and son driving along on a highway, right? Cruise at Ford Mustang, sweet ride, really fast, and they get into a terrible car accident. The father dies on impact, and the boy is severely injured and rushed to hospital. The surgeon looks at the boy and is like, well, I can't operate. Why? The boy is my son. Now, how can that be? The surgeon is the boy's mother. Now, hands up if the first thing you thought was the surgeon was a man. Of course, right? Like, everyone's like, obviously, right? And that, ladies and gentlemen, that is unconscious or cognitive bias. It's the fact that we go through the world expecting certain things, and that shapes the way we go through, that we make small decisions, and it just has to be very, very small, subtle differences in how we make decisions and what we expect and what we expect to see in a situation but like a 1% bias in how we promote people, for example, in a company with eight tiers, means that, you know, you get, if there's a 1% bias towards men in promotion, you'll get twice as many men as women reporting to the CEO. So it just has to be a tiny, tiny level of bias. Or if you're um, approaching a group of people and you assume one person is the leader, it tends to be, this, this is a great, I love this fact. Did you know that 36% of men in America are over six foot tall, but 72% over, but of CEOs are over six foot tall? There's this like correlation with height and competence. That's why I wear heels, right? It's like, mm -hmm, I'm like, you may not think I'm competent, but I will dominate, right? Anyway. So what exactly is cognitive bias? Cognitive bias is the other shortcuts our brains make, right? So we get 11 million pieces of information. Our bodies receive 11, pieces, 11 million pieces of information at any given point, but our brain can only process 40. Not enough bandwidth. And so we make shortcuts, and most of those shortcuts are fine. They're learnt from like, you know, hot stove, don't touch. That's an unconscious bias, right? But some of those, if those biases are made up on information that is flawed or information that is unfairly going to affect people in promotion, in decision-making at work, where do we end up? And there are about 150 of these biases, but I'm gonna talk really quickly about four. I talked about the first one, which is the in-group, out-group one, right? And that's really linked to, in your brain, the amygdala, the reptilian part of your brain, it's got this fight or flight mechanism, right? It goes back to, you know, we lived in villages and we had to protect ourselves from another village attacking us, right? And so things like the, the police force and the army really kind of strongly develop and play on that in-group, out-group bias. But it doesn't even have to be based on anything. If I split this room up, I said, you guys are group A and you, you guys are group B and made you like do some sort of competition, I, there will be competition. Like these, these guys will be like, oh my God, group A is the best, even though they might be best friends with people in 
on this side of the room, you'll see that that rivalry develop based on pretty much nothing, based on that in-group, out-group bias that our brains have. Like, fortunately, we have a prefrontal cortex, which is the front side of the brain, which is the thinking part of the brain that can override the amygdala. But if we allow that in-group, out-group bias to take over, we can make decisions that aren't necessarily based on true facts. The second is interesting. The second is anchoring bias. The second is I go onto a rig where somebody's worked with a female engineer and they were rubbish. And they're like, well, the first, you know, the one female engineer I've ever worked with has been terrible, so thus all female engineers are terrible. It's people taking the first piece of information they ever have about something and that anchors them in a truth that they don't want to change. Even if they, they see different information, they're anchored to that first piece. The first experience you have with a particular cereal or a particular tea bag, terrible. You're never going to buy it again. But based on what? Based on that first experience that you had. The th the third is affinity bias. And this one's really interesting because it plays out particularly in promotions. It's the fact that people like people that are like themselves. You know? You like the same football team. You went to the same university. You find pieces of information about somebody else that relates to you. If I see a swaggy Muslim chick, I'm like, yo, what's up? I'm going to hire you, right? I <laughs> That is the affinity bias that I have. I probably should check her transcript and her experience, et cetera, but I'm more likely. So how does this play out in promotions, for example? It plays out in, say, for example, I'm going to use myself as the example. Um, I have two candidates for a job, exactly the same resume, one Jack and one Layla, right? Jack is regular white dude, went to normal university, went to the same university as Layla. He comes in, he's a little bit nervous when he comes into this interview. And so when he comes into the interview, he stumbles a bit on his first answer. And I'm like, mate. And I don't really give him the time of day. But Layla comes in afterwards. She stumbles a bit on the first question. But because I feel an affinity with her, I'm like, hey, just take a breath. Just settle down, right? It's cool. I got your back. Why don't you give it another go? And that small moment of building rapport, because I see myself in her, makes the rest of the interview go beautifully. And so somehow, even though I'm never going to remember me actually taking that extra effort, right, and making that person feel calm and feel at home, even though I may not remember that piece of information, I'm going to be like, oh, my God, Layla was so much better in that interview, you know? And I just connected with her. She just got me. And so I'm going to want her in my team, even though... Jack may be just as good, maybe just as, you know, competent or whatever. But it's the fact that that affinity... And so when you think about the people you're hiring, are they people with similar worldviews and experiences? Are they going to be people that challenge the way that you look at the world and challenge the information that you are bringing to your decision? Or are they simply going to reinforce what you know? And I talked about the fourth one, which was confirmation bias. And we always, always look for information that's going to back up what we already believe. With our football team, it might be doing terribly, but you're always gonna be like, but remember that one time that thing happened? Clearly it's getting better. Even though everybody else can see that it's not. But you're, but you're, you're reading the information in a way that reinforces what you already believe. And I, I put this one in because I always, when I talk to um, other female engineers, the thing that I always get is, but I wanna be, I wanna be hired on merit, right? I don't want to be hired based on a quota, which I definitely used to agree with. Um, until I remember having a conversation with a, another bloke on the rig, and he was like, Yasmin, I don't get you women, broadly. <laughs> but he was like, you know, you go, you go on about wanting like opportunity and equality. And then if they give you a job because you're a woman, you're complaining about it. He was like, if I was gonna, give a, if I was gonna get a job because I was a bloke, I'd be like, thank you very much. I'm going to take that. And I was like, well, that's one way of looking at it. And the other, so that's the kind of emotional thing. The other part of it is the studies that show, there's a fascinating study that shows a company that says that merit is one of the values that it hires people by over compensates by hiring more men. For, so for whatever reason, there's this kind of 
belief that merit is a masculine quality. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm usually so much more, well, no, this is not true. Um, the, <laughs> the other really interesting study that came out of Australia looked at sending out 4,000 resumes with the exact same, and this is not just a gender bias thing, but it's a broad kind of cultural bias thing, the exact same resumes, and found out that if you had an Italian last name, You'd be, you have to send out 12% more resumes. If you had an Arab last name or a Middle Eastern last name, 64%. But if you had a Chinese last name, you would have to send out 68% more resumes as someone with an Anglo name. The exact same resume. And there are examples where, you know, Jennifer and John would have the same resume sent out and, you know, John would be deemed more competent and offered more money, et cetera, et cetera. So whenever people talk to me about merit, I'm like, mate, the world just does not run that way yet. And when we get to that point, maybe we can have that conversation. But it is a fallacy. And also, this is slightly cheeky, I apologise. Um, Somebody once said to me that we'll reach true equality when there are as many incompetent women in power as there are incompetent men. <laughs> We're, I'm cool with that. <laughs> so one of the, another, I'm just gonna talk to you about one more study, another really interesting study that talks about how gender is dealt with in, in, in male-dominated industries, right? And they looked at engineering in particular, and I find it really interesting because I'll go through these examples and often the women will be like, yeah, that's happened to me. And often the men will be like, I didn't ever realize that was a thing. So the first is that gender is amplified. So it's that I walk into a room and some very well-meaning individual will be like, righto, boys, no swearing, there's a lady present. I'll be like, mate, have you heard me? You have no idea. But even though that may be done out of well intentioned, like good intentions, and out of wanting to make me feel welcome and so on, what it actually does is it highlights my difference. It says here is an individual that does not actually belong to this group and we have to adjust our behavior accordingly, right? And it may be, be able to be done in a better way. Maybe it's a conversation with the individual outside saying, hey, how do you like, you know, is this behavior okay with you? Where, where are you at and so on? But the idea is, is that behavior amplifies a difference. The second is this idea of gendered expectations. It's the fact that one of the first things I'll be asked is not you know, what experience I've had, but it's whether I'm married and have kids. And the first time that happened to me, I thought the dude was cracking on to me. I didn't realize that he was just assuming because I was a woman that was the most important thing in my life. And the second, like the second part of gendered expectations is this piece around who's the person that always does the minutes, who's the person that always organizes the birthday cake, cleans up, blah, blah, blah. Some people say to me, well, it's because the dudes would be terrible at organizing the birthday cake. And it's probably true. But it's the expectation that despite whatever position you are in the company, despite how senior you are or what your role is, at the end of the day, you're a woman and a woman's job is to organize the cake. The third, oh, I have too much fun with this. The, th the third is that an individual is tuned out, right? And I guarantee you that almost every woman in this room has had this experience. Is you're sitting at a table and you suggest an idea and then for some reason nobody hears it and then a few minutes later a guy repeats it and everyone's like, Joe, what a great idea. And the chick's like, yo, I literally just said that. Uh, women, how many of you have heard if that's happened to you before? Maybe? If you feel, yeah. <laughs> and to think, for whatever reason, we hear a man's voice as one of authority. We tune the voices. Out. Someone once said to me, it's because the only voice of a woman he ever hears is his wife or mother nagging. And I was like, that is depressing. Get more female friends, man. <laughs> but it's, it goes to, you know, how we value the women in our workplace and how, like, why we may think that they're not contributing as much or if they do contribute, we sort of feel like they're talking more. And they did this really fascinating study about a, t a panel TV show. I think you guys have something similar called Question Time. Um, and whenever the woman, like, if... It was always overestimated how much a woman spoke and underestimated how much the men spoke. And it's really interesting to kind of... Think about how we think women take up space. And the fourth, the fourth is really simple. And I sum it up like this. A 
man walks into a room, a male engineer walks into a room, and he is deemed competent unless proven otherwise. A woman walks into a room, and she's deemed incompetent unless proven otherwise. I walk into a room, and I have to prove my worth. I have to prove that I deserve to be there. I have to prove that I know what I'm doing. It doesn't matter that I've graduated university, that I've, you know, whatever first-class honours or run the race team. None of those things matter. In that moment in time, I walk into a room, don't know about that one, until I do such a good job. Oh, she must be all right. And so it's how are we thinking about the people that are perhaps bringing different perspectives to the table and how are we ensuring those perspectives are included? So I've told you a couple of, like, sassily depressing things, right? But how do we mitigate it, right? How do we challenge these things? Because I don't believe biases are something that are set in stone. The first thing you can do is there's this really great survey called the IAT, done by Harvard, millions of people have done it, and it's like a really quick quiz to kind of tell you what your implicit biases are. And I didn't, funnily enough, even though I'm like all about women in engineering and so on, my implicit bias was to associate women with the homemaker role and men with the getting money role, which shocked me and told me that I need to keep checking myself and that even though it's something that I talk about and believe in, sometimes I need to sort of make sure that I'm interrogating my own decisions. The second is to call yourself out or call other people out. And I told this to the lads at work and they love doing it to me. Check your bias, Yasmin. <laughs> Regretting it. Um, but it's like, if you see something, if you're in a meeting and, a, and your female colleague shares an idea and it's repeated by somebody, just be like, hey, that was a great idea, Layla or Jane or whatever. Or if you notice that all the women are always doing the minutes or always organizing, just check it's that, Check it's what they want to do. Some, I, I got attacked by a woman after a session once because she was like, I love making the cake. How dare you take this away from me? I'm like, whoa, not my intention. <laughs> you do you, girl. But it's just about checking that that's what the individual wants to do, right? And when there are situations, calling it out if you can. And sponsoring someone different. And I say this because I am here where I am today because I was sponsored by people that, aren't, that don't share characteristics with me. I'm, and I'm very fortunate for that. And sponsorship is different to mentoring, right? Mentoring, women largely are over-mentored and under-sponsored. Mentoring is giving advice. Everyone loves giving women advice, right? Mm -hmm. But sponsoring is where you put yourself on the line for somebody else. So my sponsors have been, you know, men who are much more senior than me who have said, hey, I recognize something in you. I'm going to give you an opportunity that if you screw up is going to look bad for me, but I trust that you're going to do a good job. Right? So when you're looking at people to sponsor and to mentor, who are those people that you're offering up for promotion that other people don't think are ready yet? Who are those people that you're giving advice to and then suggesting meet with a colleague that you know has an opportunity and so on? And maybe look outside the worlds that you're typically used to. Okay, because if you don't have a shared experience with everyone in the room, how are you going to get anywhere in a world where it really is who you know? And then, so those are the individual things. At an institutional level, I think you can look at process things where you can change the process to design things out. So one of the great examples, I think, is diesel and petrol fuel nozzles, right? The, the actual size of the nozzle, like they could have thought, of, like, when they were looking at, all right, how do we design fuel nozzles, et cetera, they could have just put lots of signs up that were like, don't put diesel in your petrol car, et cetera, et cetera. But what they did was they designed the solution so that you literally can't put one nozzle in the other car. And so how do you design the system? And this is where I think it's great as engineers. We can look at it as a system that needs fixing. How do you design the system to actually have more diversity or to change the kind of sources of people that you get? And one of the ways is to like one of the ways that one particular CEO did was he said for every promotion, 
you offer three people and no two can share, more, no more than two can share a characteristic, for example. So if three people, only two can be men or only two can be brown or only two can be whatever. And that way it forces, in the same way that targets and quotas do, it forces people to look outside. It's just a nudge to make you look outside where you already may be looking. And I love this. Because the reality is, how many, of, how, many have you, how many of you have worked in a group where there are people very different and it's been really difficult? It's just been hard. Yeah. So the reality is that working with diverse teams is actually harder. That's why we like homogenous teams, right? Because it's easier, because things, you don't need to translate as much. You don't need to kind of go through so much detail. Everybody's on board. And the kind of net result across, when they've looked at kind of diverse teams across the board, the net result is actually zero. Because when diverse teams work really well, they work really well. But when they're not managed well, they do much, much worse. So we don't actually only have to look at how do we get diverse teams, we have to teach each other how to manage diverse teams better, how to get the most out of diverse teams, right? And that requires a little bit of extra. And also the study that's behind me is this great study that talks about diverse teams actually felt like they performed worse, they had less confidence in their ability, but in actual fact they performed better. They perceived that they had lower effectiveness. But that tension that comes from being different, that's how you get new ideas. We live in a world where the rules of the past no longer really apply, I mean, yes, physics, standard, but <laughs> we got that. Mm. Um, but in terms of like solutions for problems, have to be technical and social, they have to be intersectional. Right, and so we need different perspectives at the table and we need to make sure they're managed well and we need to make sure they're balanced or, or able to kind of get the most out of it without just making everyone really upset, which can happen. And it, it will be uncomfortable, right? Good times. <laughs> oh, the guys love me. They're like, who is this person? Funny thing, right? I thought being a Muslim would be the like, most difficult thing out on a rig with a bunch of guys from the deep south of the states in rural Australia, but they just couldn't get over the fact that I was a woman. And they thought my scarf was for occupational health and safety reasons. <laughs> Gotta love it. They're like, when is that coming off? I was born with it. What? <laughs> Very confused rig guys. Um, <laughs> but it's okay to be comfortable. Being comfortable is where we learn, being comfortable is where we grow, being comfortable is where the new ideas come from and where they happen. And so lean into that discomfort. Know that when you're feeling uncomfortable, that is where the most magic is gonna be. And I will leave you with this. Never underestimate the power that each and every one of you have to have an impact on the world around you, right? We don't have to change the entire world None of us have the capacity to change the entire world, but we can change the world around us. And that is such a gift. That is such an opportunity to be able to have an impact on the world around us. And I'll share one story with you. This is the last story I'll share. But I was working with a bloke. So I, like, most of the guys from, on the rig with me, you know, as I said, from the deep south, and as a black Muslim woman, I'm not their favorite person. They're just not into the Yasmin vibe. Um, one of them recently said to me that he'd gone to a KKK bar, and I was like, how was the decor? Where do you go with that? But anyway, there was, I was sitting across um, the table from a bloke. He was, just, he was not into the asthma vibe, but I noticed he was reading a motorbike magazine and had a Ducati at the front, and I'm like, this is my in. I love Ducatis. I was like, hey, man, what's up? He's like, mm-hmm. I love Ducatis. And he was like, righto. And we started having a conversation. And for the next couple of weeks, we talked about Ducatis and bikes and cars, et cetera, et cetera. We never really talked about faith. Um, and then a couple of months later, I get a message from a friend on Facebook. And she was like, hey, do you know this guy, Matt? I was like, yeah, but how do you know him? You're a nurse, completely different world. 
She was like, a really weird thing happened today. She, she came into work, and I think you work with her brother because she came in and was like, man, my brother like, met some Muslim chick on a rig, and he went from being this like, racist redneck dude to like, someone who defends Muslim people all the time, and I don't know what she did to him. I was like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's about that human connection. It's about the fact that even if I was able to have an impact on his life, and he's the one person that I've had an impact on, I've made some sort of a difference, right? And we all, like, engineering is such an amazing discipline to work in because we can make tangible difference in the world, right? That's why I picked it over law and arts. Sorry, law and arts people. Um, but we can actually make tangible difference. So I just lean into that, grab a hold of it, and realize that you can, even though the problems of the world are overwhelming, if we all do our little bit, that'll add up to something amazing. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.